Welcome back to this next reading, called Sampling and Estimation. Let's start with the big picture. Here we have a population and a sample taken from that population. A parameter is any value that describes the population, such as its mean or standard deviation. A sample statistic is used to describe the sample. The focus of this reading is to be able to obtain information or make inferences about a population by looking at a sample. But how are samples actually selected? Probability sampling gives every member of the population an equal chance of being selected. So the sample tends to be a good representation of the population. It includes simple random, systematic, stratified, and cluster sampling. Non-probability sampling depends on specific factors, so the sample may not be a good representation of the population. It includes convenience and judgment sampling. So let's review each of these individually. Simple random sampling means that members of the population are selected at random. So every time you take a sample, each member has the same chance of being selected. Systematic sampling is when you select every nth member. So for example, you could arrange this population by their age and then select every fifth member for the sample. In stratified random sampling, you divide the population into subgroups according to some criteria and then take simple random samples that maintain the proportions of those subgroups. For example, you could divide the population by color and then select a random sample that maintains the proportions of those subgroups. With cluster sampling, you divide the population into clusters, where each cluster is a mini-representation of the population. So let's create some clusters. One-stage cluster sampling is when an entire cluster is randomly selected to become the sample. Two-stage cluster sampling is when a cluster is randomly selected, but only a few observations from the cluster are randomly drawn for the sample. Convenience sampling is when elements are chosen from the population based on how accessible or convenient they are. For example, if red observations are the easiest to interview, the sample of people interviewed will probably include a large amount of red observations. And finally, judgment sampling involves selectively handpicking elements from the population based on the researcher's expertise and knowledge. Now let's talk about the sampling error. Assume that you want to estimate the average age of the people in this population. Asking every single person for their age to calculate the average is unrealistic. So instead, you select a sample of size n and get the average age of the people in that sample. Let's assume it was 18 years old. Obviously, the sample is not a perfect representation of the population. So the difference between the sample's average age and the population's average age is called the sampling error. In other words, it is the difference between the sample statistic and the quantity it is intended to estimate. However, if you want the best estimate of the population mean, you cannot just have one sample and call it a day. So let's draw a few more samples of equal size and calculate the average age for each. Now you are left with a bunch of sample means from samples that were all taken from the same population. As you keep taking more samples, you will eventually be able to plot the sample means into a distribution. And this number right here, the average of all sample means, is a good estimate of the population mean. What we just described is essentially the central limit theorem, so let's go over it. The central limit theorem states that if you have a population with mean mu and variance sigma squared and you take samples of size n, then the sampling distribution of the sample means will be normally distributed. It doesn't matter if the initial population was not normally distributed, the sample distribution will be normal. Also, the sample distribution will have a mean equal to mu, a variance equal to sigma squared over n, and a standard deviation equal to sigma over square root of n. It is important that you remember that this is also called the standard error. And just in case, here is the central limit theorem again, but in writing. Pause the video if you need to read it one more time for good measure. 
What are the three desirable properties of an estimator? Remember, an estimator is used to forecast some parameter of the population, just like the sample mean can be used to forecast the population mean. The first characteristic is that it should be unbiased. For example, the sample mean accurately forecasts the population mean, so it is unbiased. It should also be efficient, which means that the variance of its sampling distribution is smaller than any other estimator's variance. And lastly, it should be consistent. This means that as your sample size increases, the standard error falls. In other words, as n increases, you can predict the population parameter with greater accuracy. Now, let's look at a hypothetical scenario, which will make the next few concepts easier to remember. Imagine that you work for a candy factory that makes thousands of packages every single day. Your boss is worried that the packaging machine is not being very consistent, so he wants you to figure out what is the average number of pieces in each packet. You're obviously not going to open every single packet to take an average, so instead, you take a sample of 30 packets. You then count the number of pieces in each one, and you average them to get the mean of the sample. This formula, which you use to arrive at the sample statistic, is called the estimator, and the answer is called the point estimate. So now we know that the average number of pieces per bag is 18 for this sample. The issue here is that samples are not perfect representations of the population, and you wouldn't want to give your boss an incorrect answer. So how can you estimate the population mean? To play it safe, what you can do is calculate a range of values by using a confidence interval. So let's review how to do that. Assume that the sample's mean is 18 pieces. With a 90% confidence interval, you can tell your boss that you are 90% sure that the population mean falls between values A and B. So let's actually calculate that confidence interval. To calculate a confidence interval, you must use one of these two formulas. Let's label each item. Notice that the one with the Z value uses the population standard deviation, and the one with the T value uses the sample standard deviation. If you don't remember how to find the Z values in the Z table or the T values in the T table, you can go back to the reading titled Common Probability Distributions to review it. But how do you know which of the two formulas to use? Well, it depends on the information that is given to you in the problem. Here's a quick review sheet. If the population is normally distributed, and you know the population's variance, then use the formula with the Z statistic. If the population variance is unknown, use the T statistic. If you have a non-normal distribution, you cannot do the calculation if you have a small sample. But if you have a large sample, use Z values when the population variance is known and T values when it's unknown. Technically, you can also use Z values in these cases, but the T statistic gives the best answer. Pause the video if you need to take any notes. Now let's actually calculate the confidence interval we were solving for before. As a quick recap, we don't know the population mean, but we know that the sample mean was 18 pieces per bag. We want to calculate the 90% confidence interval to estimate the population mean. Assume the population is normally distributed and the sample variance is 81. To create a confidence interval, which of the two formulas should you use? Take a look at the cheat sheet. The population is normal, but we don't know its variance, so we must use T values to create the confidence interval Here's the calculation. The point estimate is the sample mean, and the critical value is found using the t-table. A common mistake is to enter the sample variance instead of the standard deviation when calculating the standard error. So be careful. And now let's just solve the equation. These are the upper and lower values of the confidence interval. Now you can confidently go up to your boss and say that you are 90% confident that the population mean falls between 14.21 and 19.79 pieces of chocolate per bag. 
Now, let's discuss resampling, which consists of either the bootstrap or the jackknife method. The jackknife method produces similar results for every run, whereas the bootstrap method usually gives different results. We'll see why in one moment. Let's start by explaining the bootstrap method. We do not know what the population looks like, but we do have a sample drawn from that population, so that becomes the estimated population, and we draw samples from there. The original sample in this case has four observations, so each resample will also have four observations. But here is the key. Once you have randomly selected the first element in the resample, that element is then put back into the original pool before the next element is selected. So there is a possibility that an element will be selected more than once in each resample. Once you have randomly drawn all the resamples and calculated each sample statistic like the sample mean, you can compute a sampling distribution from those sample statistics. A few key points to remember are that this method uses computation simulation and does not rely on an analytical formula like the z-statistic. It can be used to estimate the standard error or construct a confidence interval for many parameters such as the mean, median, and so on. Now, let's review the jackknife method which takes the entire original sample, deletes one observation, and calculates the sample statistic using the remaining observations. Each time, a different observation is deleted and the sample statistic is calculated with the remaining items. So for a sample of size n, this method requires n repetitions. The jackknife method is usually used to reduce the bias of an estimator, find the standard error, or construct a confidence interval. Moving on to a shorter and simpler topic, you should be able to describe issues that arise when selecting a sample from a population. Data snooping bias happens when you run a model over and over again. Eventually, you're going to find some pattern, but it may be the result of overdigging. Sample selection bias happens when some data is systematically excluded. A common type of sample selection bias is survivorship bias. This happens when the stocks or funds that do not survive are excluded from an investment analysis. Look-ahead bias happens when a study relies on data that was not available during the time period being analyzed. And finally, time period bias occurs when the time period used for your analysis is either too short or too long. This is the end of this reading. For more videos like these, go to wallstreetnotes.com and master the entire CFA curriculum by watching simple animated videos.